My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. Hello, and welcome to Diplomatic Immunity. My name is Kelly McFarland, Director of Programs and Research at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. Over the first three seasons of this podcast, we've covered many topics in diplomacy, from global health to disinformation to geopolitical competition between the United States and China. But there are a few regions and themes we haven't got to yet, and they include some of the most important challenges facing diplomats and U.S. foreign policy. The sheer volume of foreign policy issues on the table reflects the disordered nature of the world today and the difficulty the current administration under President Biden has in prioritizing and balancing multiple issues at once. So this spring, we wanted to look at some of those regions we haven't covered so far on the podcast, as well as some of the global issues that command attention in the halls of Washington every day. How is the administration faring in its policy toward Latin America? What direction is its Africa policy headed? Where does America stand in the fight against corruption and democratic erosion? And where is U.S. trade policy in all of this? Across several short episodes with members of the ISD community, we'll look back on the first year of Biden's term and look forward to the next. We'll then wrap up this mini-series in May with a very special guest. For the first episode in this mini-series, we spoke to Ambassador Lino Gutierrez about U.S. policy toward Latin America. Ambassador Gutierrez is a former senior foreign service officer whose final assignment was as U.S. ambassador to Argentina. During his tenure in Buenos Aires, Ambassador Gutierrez signed agreements on container security, narcotics cooperation, counterterrorism, money laundering, proliferation security, and environmental cooperation. He is now a member of the ISD Board of Advisors, and until recently was the executive director of the Una Chapman Cox Foundation, which funds one of our flagship programs the Diverse Diplomacy Leaders Speaker Series. Let's hear what he had to say on U.S. policy toward Latin America under the Biden administration. Welcome, Lino. Thank you very much, Kelly. For today, what we're trying to do is get a picture of where the Biden administration is heading into year two and moving forward for the next few years. And today we're focusing on Latin America. And you've spent a lot of time in the region. We thought you'd be a great person to talk to about this. And wanted to start off by asking, in your opinion, what are two or three of the most important issues or countries in Latin America right now and why? Well, as I look around the region, uh, I see some problems. uh, And especially to me, the number one problem is the erosion of democracy in the region. Uh, I was in in, um, 2001 in Lima, Peru, with Secretary Colin Powell when the hemisphere country signed the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which pledged that only democracies would be allowed into the family of nations uh, represented by the Organization of American States. And ever since then, we've seen a significant erosion of democracy in a number of countries. Of course, the obvious uh, outlier is Cuba, which still has the same system it has has had for the last 62 years. But on July 11th of last year, Cubans took to the streets to protest not only economic conditions, but also demanding liberty. And the government, uh, the Cuban regime replied with its usual suppressive tactics, uh, putting thousands in jail. And now uh, I think some show trials are to be expected, et cetera. So that situation hasn't improved. Venezuela has been a de facto dictatorship uh, for years uh, under first Hugo Chavez and then Nicolas Maduro, the current president. And, uh, you know, little has been done to, you know, advocate for democracy in that country. Nicaragua is a very egregious case where uh, President, I guess we should call him president for life, Daniel Ortega and his wife, the vice president, Rosario Murillo just held a sham election. Uh, And the way they dealt with the opposition was by arresting all the 
a major opposition candidates uh, and putting them under house arrest, thereby eliminating uh, any serious opposition. And uh, little has been done to pressure Nicaragua. So that to me is uh, very worrisome. There are others, uh, other presidents with authoritarian tendencies going to the fore, uh, uh, Bukele in El Salvador, uh, Bolivia uh, also. Uh, but so that's something I think that needs to be addressed. I think under President Trump, uh, little was done. I don't think President Trump cared that much about Latin America. Uh, I mean, his rhetoric could, have, could be explosive on issues like Cuba and Venezuela, but little was done in this area. Uh, in addition to that, there are two other things I would look at. One is Latin America's serious economic troubles, uh, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, they have problems, of course, of poverty. They have problems in infrastructure. Uh, and as far as US interests are concerned, you have China coming into the region and trying to fill a gap that may have been left by the United States. So we need to be supporting uh, the Latin American countries as they recover from the pandemic and uh, competing with a China uh, effort, the Belt, Silk and Belt Road, uh, by supporting the needs of these countries. And then, of course, there's migration, which is a domestic political issue, as well as a foreign policy issue, where the Biden administration has committed to uh, better treatment of migrants at the border and for attacking the conditions that lead uh, people to migrate from these countries. Uh, but a lot, a, lot has, a lot more has to be done in this area. Uh, we also see in Latin America uh, the move toward uh, more authoritarian and more leftist uh, regimes, not the traditional left. For example, in Chile, a 35-year-old student leader uh, is the new president of Chile, Mr. Boric. Uh, and now you have in Peru, uh, Mr. Castillo, who is a professor and indigenous leader. Uh, you know, Honduras just elected uh, a president that was the wife of the former president Zelaya, who had been uh, hostile to the United States. So we have to deal with these issues as well. Even in Mexico next door, uh, Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, has committed uh, some violations in human rights, etc. And our agenda has been so far just to deal with migration. And there are many other areas we can deal with with Mexico. On the good side, I would say that the Biden administration has changed the rhetoric. It is no longer a lecturing posture, top down, but it's more of a uh, they've reestablished a dynamic of cooperation with the region, and that is good. Uh, and more attention is being paid to Latin America. I think our vaccine diplomacy has ramped up, and uh, Latin Americans are very grateful for the aid of the United States in this area by providing vaccines. And our vaccine and vaccines that work, unlike some of our competitors' uh, vaccines who don't work as much. I, I have friends in Colombia who are begging for some of our vaccines when they had only received some of the Russian and Chinese vaccines. But now that is changing. Uh, I think the appointment of Brian Nichols as Assistant Secretary for the Western Hemisphere, a very capable career diplomat. It took a very long time to name him and get him confirmed. But now that he's on board, I think that will help uh, quite a bit. And the administration has a great opportunity in June when it'll host a Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. And it is a meeting of the 34 uh, democratic countries of the hemisphere, uh, or, you know, originally democratic countries. And this is a, a good time to, you know, bring out some initiatives, maybe in infrastructure and in helping uh, the Latin American countries. Uh, so, the administration, I think, has some good opportunities coming up to improve the situation in the coming year. 
So you mentioned the democratic backsliding in Latin America, and there's been a huge push, obviously, by the Biden administration to revitalize democracy. They had the Summit for Democracy um, in the in December. But it, it seems like, at least rhetorically, and where their attention has been on that has been in Europe. And you mentioned the level of backsliding that's going, been going on in Latin America and the rise of authoritarianism and China creeping its way in through the Belt and Road and everything. So how can the Biden administration sort of shift or do a better job of viewing this as part of their broader, you know, the, it seems at this point that, you know, democracy versus authoritarianism is, is sort of their driving national security strategy. Um, you know, how do they fit that in better in your mind? President Biden has considerable experience in Latin America. He, um, I think, uh, under President Obama as vice president, he paid particular attention to, to Latin America. So he knows the region and he knows the problems. I think part of the, the problem was the stalling of nominees in the Congress, uh, ambassadors and the assistant secretary position. That is changing. So that should give us a boost. And of course, this, the summit presents an opportunity to unleash new programs, uh, but I think it's uh, it would be a missed opportunity for the administration if they were just to concentrate on Europe or the Middle East. When you have a, a region here of similar values that is, I think, ripe for engagement and for a dialogue. Uh, so I think the administration has to demonstrate that they can walk and chew gum at the same time. And, uh, you know, non neglect democracy in this part of the world. It's th These are difficult issues. Uh, they're pretty hard to do. Uh, but President Trump showed that uh, rhetoric was not enough. And, and rhetoric, when you say something, you should mean it. And President Trump threatened with, uh, did not rule military action in Venezuela, but then nothing, didn't follow up with anything. And now we have Russia, for example, saying that uh, in order to preserve their own security, they're considering uh, deploying troops in friendly countries like uh, Venezuela and Cuba. So I think it behooves the administration to take a very close look at this and to you know, engage in a very strong dialogue with these countries in the region. Yeah, another aspect of, of what we've been working on recently at ISD is corruption. And you mentioned, I mean, obviously, that's a huge part of authoritarianism. Democratic backsliding is creeping kleptocracy and, 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 and rising corruption. And you mentioned the economic tr troubles, infrastructure and all these things that are that, are, that these, a lot of these Latin American countries are having issues with. What, how do you see the, the role of corruption in Latin America and how do you see that as another potential opportunity because the, you know, the administration has, is focusing so much on corruption, rightfully so in, in our mind. Yeah, I agree. Corruption is a longstanding problem. It goes back to the Spanish conquest. Uh, when Spain uh, established an extractive economy that really didn't pay much attention to the development of uh, these new countries. And in order to survive, uh, public officials and others had to, uh, they had a, a saying called obedezco pero no cumplo. I obey you, but I will not comply. And that was the beginning of taking some, you know, 15% of whatever it was at that time. So I think what, what has changed, and corruption exists everywhere. I mean, we're not totally innocent uh, on this. But what, what is changing is shining a light on corruption, exposing it more and more. Uh, and this has its dangers. Uh, We've seen journalists killed in Mexico for exposing drug corruption and things like that. So I think we need to to shine a light on it. We need to sign agreements. We need to sanction those who violate the law. And we've done some of that. Uh, we have to continue doing it. But at the same time, we need to balance our interests. Uh, for example, we're promoting green uh, you know, programs uh, in the region, which is great. But if you do it at the expense of other traditional fossil fuel programs or whatever, China will come in and try to fill the gap. So I think we need to be smart about it. Uh, 
don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, dealing with, for example, El Salvador, which is a friendly country, happens to have a president who has become authoritarian, threatening the Congress and everything. Uh, so we need to, to be firm on that, but at the same time, not stop all dialogue, continue to talk and explain uh, the advantage of dealing with the United States. Uh, we have an opportunity in Honduras where the new president has a record of being, you know, not too friendly to the U.S., but she will need help in providing security uh, to her population. And the U.S., I think, can fill a gap there as well. So we, we need to be smart about it. We need to promote our goals and be uh, be firm on that, but at the same time, uh, keep the dialogue going with all these countries and look for alternatives wherever we can. All right, Lino, we'll get you out of here on one last question. If you were President Biden's professor, what grade would you give them at this point, uh, one year in, moving into the year number two of the administration? I will not yield to the temptation of saying something provocative. But, so I will give them an I for incomplete with papers to be turned in. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. 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 We're only like, uh, you know, we're only in like September of the fall semester th at this right. point. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm looking forward to the second year uh, and to seeing uh, improvement. So we'll see. But at least the rhetoric, I think the Latin American countries know they have a an interlocutor who at least will listen uh, now, which they didn't have before. All right. Well, Lino, um, I want to thank you for spending some time with us this morning. As always, it was great talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Diplomatic Community. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please share the episode on social media and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us wherever they listen to podcasts. This episode was produced by Alistair Somerville. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu to learn more about our work. Until we meet again.